This is the Woke Daisy. Welcome back to a brand new episode of The Woke Thacy. As always, hit us with five stars on Apple Podcasts, share with your friends, DM us topics that you're interested in, and let us know what you want to hear. Today's topic is one that we got a flood of DMs about. So you asked, we heard, and here is the episode. But before we begin, we usually don't get to do this because we always have guests on, so I want to do a quick life update. So one, Annika just came back from Greece, so make sure you go on her Instagram and look at all her vacay photos. And two, it's Annika's birthday week. So this beautiful human being has turned a new age. <laughs> and so everyone go on our Instagram, flutter with all the birthday love, birthday messages, because she deserves it. So happy birthday, Annika. Thank you, Nehal. You're so sweet. She's such and, a cutie. <laughs> and sort of life update, I feel like for me, has been just trying to take the next step in life. I feel like I'm kind of stuck right now. After I turn 25, I want to kind of do more things, whether it's with my career or go back to school or something. So TBD what, what I'm doing, guys. So stay tuned. I'm still trying to figure it out. It's so funny you say that because I'm in the opposite place where I am trying to cut back on a couple of things and streamline life down to what's most important to me and being like, okay, this is where I'm putting my efforts. This is where it's going and sort of kind of getting ready for whatever the next phase is, like marriage and children and settling down a little bit more, which is which is so different than where you are now. Yeah. I'm just like, do I need to make a career change right now? Do I have to go back to school? Do I want my MBA? And it's too many questions right now and too many <laughs> paths, and I don't know what I want to take. So I've been really overwhelmed lately, but I'm excited to always do The Woke Daisy with you because it always puts me in a good headspace. Same here. This podcast has been so amazing for just – not only making me learn a lot of different things, but also getting to know you, Nihil, and getting to know all of these guests. And it's just become such a passion project and a business. And it's so much fun to do each week. I really look forward to doing it, I think. So before we begin, I just want to say that I've always known that there's been a lot of racism and colorism problems in the South Asian community. But I thought, you know, if I'm not participating in it, then maybe it's not that big of a deal. But after researching today's episode, holy crap, the things that I have learned, the things that need to change, and the things that we need to do better as a community. So I'm hoping this episode is eye-opening for some of y'all. So as I mentioned, colorism is huge in South Asia. Imagine being told that being darker than your neighbor is sinful. Grandmas are quick to tell their grandchildren to avoid the sun because God forbid you get dark. Dark is bad. White is good. I mean, how many times have you guys heard this? I know I have. Being darker will reduce your chances of getting married. So put on some fair and lovely. Maybe you'll get lighter. These conditioned traits really highlight how our community interacts with black people. South Asians find it easier to exploit the black community than repair their own views towards them. Which leads us to the topic of racism in South Asia, also known as anti-blackness. And colorism is directly related to anti-blackness, as you mentioned, Nihal. A lot of this just sort of stems from classism, which predates the arrival of the British. If you look at our caste system, it's been ingrained for a really, really long time, thousands of years that black people are somehow less than. And you know what's crazy is that sometimes people in our community actually feel like they have the right to align themselves with black people as if their struggle has been equal. And I know we talk a lot on this podcast about how we need to fight for other people's fights as well and make it important. And all of that is true. But I think to say our fight is equal to your fight is a completely different statement. And many South Asians did suffer during the British colonialism. And they are definitely justified in fighting back. But when they start claiming that oppression that they face is similar to what black people have faced, they're not only belittling the centuries of torture and abuse that Africans have experienced, but they're also really ignoring the obvious face that South Asians were once slave owners. And by trying to be white, we're just sort of putting ourselves into positions of power, like the biases that we've discussed in previous episodes and that we'll be discussing today. One of the things that I learned about when we were researching for this episode was the history of slavery that South Asia has conveniently eliminated from our history books. A group called the Siddhi or Siddhi or Shidi or Hubshi come from the Bantu people of East Africa, and they were forcibly brought to India, namely in Karnataka, Gujarat, and Hyderabad, which was at the time called the Deccan or an Azam state. And as the Portuguese and other Europeans sort of colonized different parts of Asia, they had these ports and these headquarters like off the coast of Mumbai, and they brought a ton of Africans through those spaces. And 
there's actually communities. They're very small, but they're communities of Afro-South Asians in Sri Lanka and India, and likely more than that as well. And it's super interesting because we don't really realize that they exist, but they're in touch with their culture still, and they still brought a lot of things from Africa that they still utilize today. And we have just completely eliminated them from the narrative. So when we define what anti-blackness is, we hear terms like racism, ignorance, stereotypes, misrepresentation, and appropriation. Anti-blackness can include microaggressions, such as subconsciously not associating yourself with black people, and macroaggressions, like using the N-word. So today, we will be exploring the different areas we see within anti-blackness in the South Asian community. And make sure to participate in the conversation on our Instagram, guys, because I know this was heavily requested. So let's go back to colorism and our history with it. Centuries of colonialism have led to the systematic biases that favor whiteness, and they've contributed to this whole concept of light being better. And historically, one's caste or social class is also identified with skin color. Brahmins, who are at the top of the social hierarchy in the caste system, were traditionally deemed as fair, while lower castes were deemed as having a darker complexion. Now, I'm going to speak to this a little bit from the, my own personal experience. I am a Brahmin from a really practicing priest family. And what I can say about that is that I hear and kind of understand or tried my best to understand the arguments not only against caste, but the detriment to caste because I'm in this privileged place where I get fed free meals because people think that feeding Brahmins is good luck. And I get different benefits from all of that that I have to acknowledge. And it's really important for me to really try and hear the opposite side of that and hear about the people that have been pushed down. And one of those things is that people who are Brahmin or, you know, really in tune with the Vedas and things like that have always been that they get a glow and that glow is code for light skin and that anyone who's not quite as acquainted with that knowledge is darker and therefore people who are on the streets or people who are laborers are quite obviously not Brahmin because they have darker skin. And one of the things that kind of drives me crazy about that basic assumption is that the knowledge that laborers are probably also out in the sun a lot more because that's what their jobs are. For example, if you're constructing homes and you're outside, you're obviously going to get darker. And if you're inside teaching a Veda class, then you're probably going to be lighter. And so there's a lot of, you know, just inherent bias that comes with caste and with being a higher class versus a lower class. And all of those are associated with skin colors and whether you know, dark is automatically seen as a lower caste or dark is automatically seen as a lower class of society somehow. And that's just unfair. Which brings us to our highest selling whitening cream, Fair and Lovely, which takes up, (laughs) Fair and Lovely actually takes up 50 to 70% of India's entire market share. That's how much money they're putting towards Fair and Lovely. Yes, I did the research. Yeah. And it's crazy. When I was on the streets of uh, Kolkata, when I was visiting family, every corner I turned had a fair and lovely poster. And actually, I've had my own fair, fair, haha, I've had my own fair share of experience with fair and lovely. Because growing up, my sister was always more fair than me. So my grandparents would always be like, hey, you should try out fair and lovely. They actually also gave me this thing called dud basin, which is literally milk and flour. And you kind of combine it and you put it all over your face to let it dry because apparently when you wash it off you'll become maybe a shade lighter and it's so crazy because even now I feel like that's been so ingrained in my mind that hey lighter is better that when I go to Mexico when I go to vacation and stuff I stay away from the sun or I put on a lot of sunscreen because I don't want to come back and have my grandparents or parents be like oh you got so much darker and they don't say it with like a hey, you got a nice tan. Look at that glow. No, they say it like you got darker. That's not good, which has kind of led to a lot of crazy things in India, like bleaching of the skin. I mean, when you have A-listers like Priyanka Chopra making a career out of selling skin whitening creams while promoting this ideology of white being right, I mean, did you really expect anything different? Honestly, I've just been having a real big problem with Priyanka Chopra as a whole lately, so we need to do a whole episode on that. 
But have you heard about Bollywood actress Isha Gupta, who had a passion for Arsenal Football Club, by football, I mean soccer. The actress decided to share a screen grab of a WhatsApp conversation with one of her friends and mock the team's Nigerian star, his name was Alex Awobi, as a gorilla and Neanderthal who, quote, evolution has stopped for. The actress responded to her friend's comments by saying ha 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 and then continued to post screenshots of the conversation on her Instagram. So keep in mind, this is the same actress that helped this team unveil its 2017 away kit. So I don't understand what's more wrong. The racial slurs, the fact that she thought it was funny, or the fact that she calls herself a supporter, yet shares this on her social media. Isha Gupta later dug herself into a bigger hole when she apologized, and then she claimed that she was a victim of racism herself. She just kind of dug herself deeper into this complacency about anti-blackness. The Secretary General of the Association of African Students in India was actually not surprised at all by her actions and her apology. He said that racism is not something which is very hidden here. It's very open. People look at you and regard you as a cannibal, which is so heartbreaking to hear because why should anyone have to live like that? On the topic of entertainment and media, can we talk about how Bollywood treats its black characters? So I know we talked about this earlier in some episode, but do you remember that movie Fashion with Priyanka Chopra? Well, in this movie, she's caught in this downward spiral of drinking and drugs. And the moment that she realizes that she hits rock bottom is when she wakes up next to a black man. The racial undertones of her realization were so freaking clear. Rock bottom equals black man. But honestly, this stems from way long ago. Do you remember when Mr. India came out? That movie came out when I was a kid. And let's be real. I, you were non-existent, (laughs) so you may not remember this movie. But you had to have heard the famous song, Hawa Hawaii. They recently did a remake of this song, actually. There's Indian men wearing black paint behind Sri Devi during the dance sequence. And speaking of black paint, blackface was super common in Bollywood. So so many act- so many films had actors paint their faces black and gasp and snarl to show this sort of tribalness. It was kind of gross. Bollywood films have played a major role in enforcing the idea that dark-skinned men from Africa are tribal, whose ways are primitive, and because of this, they are an object of wonder and use as showpieces and song sequences. If not that, they become drug dealers by default. In Dham Mara Dham, they literally called the drug cartel the Nigerian drug cartel. There's numerous examples through the history of Bollywood where you're going to see these dark-skinned individuals and they're demonized and they're exaggerated comically. And it's at this point where individuals have become objects in public consciousness and not humans. And once a human becomes an object, it's easier to evoke violence on them, which is literally what happened to innocent Africans like Endurance Amalawa, who was beaten in a mob near Delhi in March 2017. And then that attack followed the drug overdose of an Indian teenager, and he was blamed for it because he was apparently, quote unquote, a Nigerian drug dealer. We like to think of ourselves as these victims of racism, like, oh shit, look at these people calling us curry or asking us if we're a telemarketer or if we work at a 7-Eleven. But there's not an understanding that we are also perpetrators of racism. I mean, let's take a look at the most recent scandal with Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. If you haven't heard about it, long story short, he painted his face brown, or some might say black, to match his Aladdin costume at an Arabian Nights themed event. Yet many South Asians genuinely think that he did nothing wrong, saying it was a harmful, honest mistake and there are other pressing issues to worry about versus that. Also, there's literally a South Asian candidate running too who hasn't done something like this. So why aren't South Asians rallying behind him? Why Justin Trudeau? I just don't get it. And it feels like sometimes when you look at that, it's easier to stand in solidarity with the white candidate than it is to stand in solidarity with one of your own because you know that they're quote unquote less than the white candidate. When you read about the whole Justin Trudeau thing, what were kind of like the thoughts that came to your mind? I was really upset because I love him. And (laughs) see, like many South Asians. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I just thought he was so handsome. And to be honest, as crazy as it sounds, that video of him doing banger was the cutest thing I've ever seen. So I was really stuck and really upset when I saw that because I felt like you should know better. And on one hand, I was like, well, he was young and, you know, you want to write it off as just ignorance and you don't want to just constantly crucify people on one mistake, even if it was a spectacularly stupid one, you know, but Likewise, he should have known better, especially if he was running for prime minister. What were you, or, you know, at any point, what are you thinking? Now let's talk about the N-word. Oh, the N-word. I feel like many people have this really complicated relationship with it when it should be as simple as black and white. The way I view it, if you're not black, don't use it. But then, to play devil's advocate with myself, what if you grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood and you adapted the use of black culture, and with black culture comes the N-word? 
Well, we talked about this a little bit with cultural appropriation. That's how a lot of people who grew up in Toronto feel. They get introduced to black culture, adapt it better than the white culture. And without understanding the weight of history on their shoulders, these people group together other cultures underneath the umbrella of marginalization. And plenty of South Asian youth consider themselves black and exploring the culture. And they just sort of take on the identity and for the capital gain, for the cultural gain. And They don't necessarily live the experience of being black. So they're really negating that really important aspect of it and just sort of taking the good parts. And they're not really recognizing the fact that accepting that history also accepts a lot of negativity and a lot of fights and battles. And they're not willing to take that on. And that in and of itself is sort of anti-black too. Let's take the example of Canadian Indian rapper Nav, who is huge now because of his relationships with Meek Mill, Drake, and The Weeknd. In his lyrics, he received a lot of backlash for using the N-word. When asked why, he said his neighborhood was multicultural. Everybody used that word freely. He actually, quote unquote, said, the Chinese man said it to the Indian guy, the Indian man said it to the black guy, and so we were all just throwing it around. He didn't really think of it as anything, but in a more recent interview in 2017, he did claim he would stop using the word because he understands the global impact of it. But like Nav, many brown youth continues to use the N-word. My friends and peers drop it like it's just a word. I know people who justify the use of the N-word by getting consent from their black friends. So literally someone going up to their black friend being like, hey, bro, can I use the N-word? Yeah, sure, bro. Okay, I can use it. Brown celebrities like Riz Ahmed and Zayn Malik are the in the spotlight just as much, yet they stay away from this language. They understand that we have our own culture to represent without stealing from others, knowing that when we trade language, there are enough words to choose from and the N-word is not one of them. South Asians believe that they're entitled to use the N-word because we were also oppressed and continue to face racism. But again, we cannot compare our struggles and it is not a free pass to practice anti-blackness ourselves. And I'm going to be completely honest. I definitely have used the word before because I heard my peers drop it so casually in high school. But after learning the weight of the word, I completely cut it out of my dictionary. So let's all just start small. We can't get everyone to stop saying it, but maybe talk to your cousin, your brother, or your boyfriend. I'm actually curious to know what your thoughts are about using the N-word when singing a song then, because like Nav or like anybody else, you know, they're using that in their art. I feel like it's okay if you're singing a song, because if you're really into hardcore rap and they are saying it often, are you just going to bleep it out every time? What if they're using it every other word? What if you just don't use it? At all? Like just keep cuts? Just cut it out. I don't know. I don't agree with that. I feel like if it's part of a song already and it's there, then might as well use it. Even a lot of the clean versions of music still keep it sometimes. So if they're keeping it, do we have to cut it out as well? This may be something that I just genuinely don't understand because I'm not black, to be honest. Like I I don't understand the implication because I have not lived that struggle in order to be able to throw those words around. So to me, it seems like a swear word. And, you know, it's kind of like when a white person calls us brown people, we're kind of like, oh, my God. But yeah. then, like, we all call each other brown people all the time. And I'm our- trying to think of a Daisy equivalent of, like, a, so- or a word that we use in a song that people also use, but I can't think of any right now. I just have a funny relationship, I think, with that word in general. I've mentioned my ex-boyfriend who was Caucasian. And when we were in our really early 20s, like, probably juniors or seniors in college, He lived with a couple people who are a lot older than him, maybe like mid to late 20s and white. And they used to drop the N-word whenever one of them did something stupid. And eventually my boyfriend had caught on to that too. And I remember them – I remember asking them not to say it because it really just struck me as wrong at the time. It was just morally didn't feel like the right thing to say or do. And to them, they said, oh, well, to us it always just meant someone's being an idiot, so we just throw it around. And even then, despite – them defending it. I was this college student who just wasn't as outspoken as I am now. And it stuck with me. Like being in a room full of white people throwing that word around, equating stupidity with a word that's associated with being black and historically associated with violence. Like, and then I'm the only minority in the room who didn't have the courage to speak up. It just is a really big privilege situation and power dynamic in that particular case. And so I just have a really weird relationship with that word. And so I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, God, I don't want anyone using it. I would just wish we could just eliminate it completely. But I might also just, you know, like I mentioned, not understand what the weight of the word is. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, I just think that our culture doesn't do a good job of telling people no to that word. Um, Like growing up, you hear like 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds now starting to use it because they heard it in high school or middle school. Like I said, I heard it too. And then it was just like, oh, it's just a word. But I think you really need to 
tell someone, hey, don't use that word. This is the weight of the word. And this is what all the history behind it. So just don't use it. Use, I don't know, a different word. I think it's sort of like that word whenever people call people a retard. That one for me hits so hard and I get so upset whenever people use that word at all. And Mm -hmm. I really call people out. I make an active effort to call people out on that. And I think it's something similar. It's just associated with something negative or power dynamic Mm -hmm. or an ability. And because of that, somebody's in power, someone's not, and you're making it clear through your speech. And again, similar, the word, you're so gay. Yeah, People are saying you're so gay. You're literally talking about the LGBTQ community when you're saying that. Are you, what are you doing? But I think, again, you don't know this until someone really just tells you, hey, this is the weight of the word. Um, A few weeks ago, we actually talked about cultural appropriation Mm -hmm. and where to draw the line because what you might think is cultural appropriation, I actually didn't. We got so many comments on that on Instagram about what people thought was cultural appropriation and whether people thought it was okay or not okay. It was pretty much 50-50 divided through all the photos that we had put up. For everything. Yeah. For everything. It kind of makes you wonder, do you think the same thing could be true for anti-blackness? So a perfect example is that Rupi Kaur wrote a poetry book called Milk and Honey, which I loved and I know you did too. And she was accused for stealing from a black London poet named Wahid. Now, this is where it gets complicated. People claim that she stole the metaphor and imagery of honey and water the same as this Wahid poet. But one could argue that imagery of honey and water has been used since the 6th century. Yet people claim that since she didn't cite Wahid and hasn't spoke on the issue, there's some anti-blackness issue correlated because of where credit is due. I'm really torn on this because I really want to say, I always want to err, like err on the side of, okay, the person who's being victimized should be believed and we should side with them. But as an artist, as a writer myself, I struggle because milk and honey, oil and water, or milk and oil, those kinds of combinations are often used to describe different races or different mixes of things that don't go together or kind of provide some sort of contrast. So I don't know that milk and honey would necessarily be the most original thing that you could attribute to one person versus something that's been said and used throughout history as just an example of just great writing or, you know, so I'm not really sure in this particular case, especially because I don't know all the facts, but, you know, I think (laughs) um, Milk and Honey, I I love the book. I don't know if I can really say that that was anti-blackness. Lily Singh claimed that she created the word boss, spelled B-A-W-S-E. That word is so embedded in the African-American English that it predates to the 90s in hip-hop songs. She didn't give the African language credit, so is that showing anti-blackness or is this a case of cultural appropriation? Ooh, that's tough. I don't know that it's anti-blackness because we also accuse her constantly of cultural appropriation. So which direction are we really going with? I think that there's a really fine line between the two. So I think we need to talk a little bit about that. So a fine line between cultural appropriation and anti-blackness. Again, anti-blackness is related to colorism and racism towards black people that a lot of people in the South Asian community do. But cultural appropriation is more appropriation of the culture that they're doing. Right? So, yes. So in that case, by saying she's a boss, doesn't that just mean that she's taking from 90s culture and appropriating it as her own? I agree. So this is not a case for anti-blackness. Why do you think a lot of South Asians have DM'd us about making anti-blackness a topic? Like, why do you think it's so important in our community to let people know? Because I think that there's a certain number of people who are aware of this bias and who are actively trying to change it. And it's really important to them because they're seeing it all the time versus a lot of people who don't even realize it exists or care to recognize that they're doing it. And South Asian culture generally, we can be pretty blasé about the whole thing and just not care about what we're doing that can hurt other people. And, you know, I think that that's something that people are trying to raise awareness around. And there's a lot more pushes towards sort of inclusivity now. And I think that that's part of this. It's it's kind of being like, listen, be aware of what you're doing and be aware that we inherently hold these biases. Know your history. Don't be an idiot. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that people were saying for our interracial relationship episode was that they said we should have done not just a white and a brown couple. We should have done maybe a black and a brown couple. That would have been that was great feedback. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good feedback, but people were kept constantly saying we should have done a black and a brown person because I really do think that there are a lot of relationships like that and they go through the stigma of the anti-blackness. 
They absolutely would. Because think about it. You mentioned it, too, with the interracial relationship. Don't marry a BMW. And what's the first thing on that list is black. And everybody, you know, as you mentioned with the example with Priyanka Chopra and fashion, like, Mm -hmm. that's theoretically pushed forward as the lowest that we can go. And that's awful. And there's inherent racism, too. I know with a lot of grandparents that have come to the U.S. on visits, people always mention how there's a ton of African-Americans here. And Mm -hmm. a lot of grandparents are like, oh, aren't you scared? And I'm like, you realize that we're also not white, right? And secondly, that we that you're putting ourselves as a superior race simply because of color. You don't know a single thing about them. You know what I don't understand, though? Because um, a lot of South Asian families and their grandparents and their history are from African countries. So I know my cousins and stuff are from Kenya. Like, their roots are from Kenya. And so why can you be racist when your roots are from Kenya? Like, literally, my uncle has his whole family background from Kenya, like what he did, his he still has family there. Yet people in his family are still racist towards African-Americans. But I think that that goes back to the histories again of where colonialism played a role, how these people got to where they got to. So whether that means how did Africans get to India or whether that means how did Indians get to Africa and make themselves superior. Or in some places like South America, Indians – for their light skin, were actually discriminated against, and the more dark you were, it was beautiful. So I think you have to really know the history of how you ended up where you ended up and how your skin color or how that colorism or anti-blackness played a role in your life and how you ended up where you are today. Love that. So what can we do to be better? I think we should unlearn the harmful behavior and things that have been ingrained in our minds since we were younger and actively call people out when they indulge in it. I know I keep saying that, but I think that's the only way. Similar to our cultural appropriation episode, all we really can do is be active. When an elder tells you not to speak to black people or refers to them as kalu while moving you away from them, say something. When your mom questions whether the neighbors are druggies because they are black, say something. There is no solution that can happen unless we admit that there is a problem. South Asia has an anti-black racism problem, and we need to do better. So the next time you see a hashtag Black Girl Magic trending on Twitter, let's try and not retaliate with hashtag Brown Girl Magic. And let's just stand with them and buy them and applaud at their achievements and celebrate them like we would do with anybody else. All right. So before we wrap up, Nail's favorite time. It's rapid fire rounds. So just two quick rounds today. And on the topic of just anti-blackness, we're going to do some pro-blackness with some of our favorite actors and actresses in TV and entertainment. So your favorite African-American actor. Will Smith or maybe Denzel. And Octavia Spencer is really great too. Mine is Lupita Nyong'o. Also, Black Panther was freaking amazing. Oh my gosh, Chadwick Boseman. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I should have said him. (laughs) Our second question is your favorite TV show or movie with a black cast? Obviously, Fresh Prince, but that's just a throwback. Actually, recently, I really got into Scandal. I watched all the seasons of Scandal. And what blows my mind, which is becoming now my common phrase, is Shonda Rhimes and her writing ability is incredible because she writes the world as it really is. And going along with Shonda Rhimes, Carrie Washington and How to Get Away with Murder is Viola Davis. They are both such brilliant actresses and they bring any so even though their shows aren't full black casts i have to say that they are just exceptional exceptional actresses my favorite is sterling k brown from this is us oh my god i love him (laughs) his acting he deserves all the oscars and emmys in the world (laughs) (laughs) agreed i definitely agree This episode was a little bit shorter than we usually do, but we realized that we're going into the holidays, November is bananas, and everybody is going to be off on their own direction for a little while. But we did want to cover this topic because it's been so hotly requested by all of our listeners. So once again, you asked and we delivered. Let us know your thoughts. Follow us on Instagram or on Facebook at The Woke Thacy. And check out our website at thewokethacy.com and let us know what your thoughts are. As we always say, get woke, stay woke. This is The Woke Thacy.